move, we're going to move along. Our, our next speaker is a very dear friend of mine, Jay Schaefer, and his partner, Joe Rizzo. They are the directors of Absolute Return Associates, or ARA. ARA is a management consulting firm that focuses on helping its clients achieve success. Both Jay and Joe have extensive domestic and international experience with organizations ranging from very large to very small and from startup to mature. Their comments today are based on the practical lessons they've learned from this experience, things entrepreneurs have done that have helped them be successful, and things that entrepreneurs have not done that have contributed to their failure. I'd love to hear that. So you can use this microphone, or you can use that microphone, or both. Or neither. Or neither. OK. Um, thank you, Les. Thank you very much. Thank you, Les, and thank you, board of the Hudson Valley Center for Innovation, for inviting us here today. And thank you, each and every one of you, for attending and sharing with us. We're really very excited to be here for two reasons. Number one, because we have great admiration for any organization that offers assistance to entrepreneurs, because we happen to think entrepreneurs are the engines that drive this country. And anyone that can help entre entrepreneurs do their job better, we're all for it. We support it. Number the second reason why we're excited about being here is because we really think, we really know, we have a message that's valuable. We know that because it's based on our experience. You may not be able to tell by looking at me and looking at Joe, but we've been around a couple of years. Okay, well, I don't want anybody to see me. Um, well, actually, under the heading of housekeeping, since Les complained it was hot up here. Can you hear me without the microphone? A lot of people didn't respond. Is that you? Okay, I will use it. Tell me if I'm now talking too loud. Um, our experiences, Joe and I have a lot of, many, many years, more than I care to think about, working as consultants and working in the corporate world. Most of our work, as Les said, has been, has been focused on turnarounds and uh, startups. There's no better, the first piece of advice I can give everybody here today, there's no better place to learn how to be successful than working in a turnaround situation. There's no place where you can learn more about what didn't go right and what wasn't done and what should be done than when you're working in a situation where you've got to figure out what did people do wrong and how do I correct it. The comments we're going to make today are based on the insights that we have learned from that work. And that's why we know that our message is a good message because it's based on lessons that we've learned. Okay, so that message focuses on will you be in business and will you be successful in five years? If I suddenly disappear, it's just because I took a step forward. I'm trying to stand out of the light here. Most of you are here today because you've got a great idea for a new product. Well, the interesting thing is you're not alone in the fact that you've got an idea. Once upon a time, two of the most valuable brands in the world had good ideas also. Classic Coke and Euro Disney. Other well-known names, names like Ford, names like Apple, names like Sony, also had good ideas along the way. So you're not alone with your good idea. And in fact, an organization called Ben Gay, I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with Ben Gay, a, a, a cream that you rub onto yourself when, um, when you're sore, they had an idea once to turn that cream into an aspirin. I'm not so sure that was a good idea, but it was an idea they had and they thought it was a good idea. So you're not alone with your good ideas. However you say, you're different than those organizations because you think you know the right way to do it. Well, guess what? O other organizations have thought they know the right way to do it too. I don't have to spend a lot of time talking about uh, who, uh, those organizations right now. I could just refer to um, one in particular, which is the the finance industry in total. We don't, we don't have to look much further than today's newspapers or today, hear the news on uh, today to understand 
that something went very wrong in the mortgage and finance business beyond the credit problems. They expanded too fast. They didn't develop the right, they didn't think it through. They didn't plan for it. They didn't develop the right procedures. They weren't doing the right thing. And as a result, they're going to suffer to the tune of billions of dollars because they did not plan properly for what was, turned out to be, I guess, a very successful operation at the beginning. So, with that as a backdrop, I say to you, you think you've got a good idea? You think that you know how to do it? Well, at the end of the day, when everything comes together, are you doing the right thing now to ensure or to at least increase the probability that in five years you will still be in business and you will be successful? My goals for our short talk this morning, uh, three goals. Actually, um, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything you don't already know. I think there's a lot of smart people in this room, and you know all the concepts. But I, what I think Joe and I can offer to you, I think our message, wh what it will do, is it will help you organize what you already know. And most importantly, the real message we want to put across is we want to make sure that we leave you with the idea of the interaction of everything you have to do and the impact of everything you have to do on each other. That is the main message that we're going to try and put across. Whether you're a startup, early phase startup, and you're only thinking about the future, you're a mature company and you're already doing everything, or you're somewhere in between and you're phasing in everything you have to do. One of the biggest problems we have found in our turnaround work is the fact that organizations always focus on one or two or three things and lose sight of other things, and it's those other things that ultimately fail them. You've got to remember all the components, and you've got to understand how those components interact with each other, and you've got to constantly be focusing on that. So our goals are first to introduce a tactic, what we call uh, the ARA Tactical Framework for Success. I'll actually be talking about, Joe, you want to give those out? I'll actually be talking about each one of the components of that framework for success. The second thing we're going to, the second goal for today is what Joe is handing out right now. We want to give you a simple tool to help you assess where your thought process is, or if you're already in business, where you are in relation to that, um, uh, in relation to that framework. And then our third goal for the day is to just help you highlight your priorities in terms of the things you're not thinking about or the things you're not doing, what should you be working on next? Where should you be going? Okay, and one last thing. Uh, we have a lot to say and a little bit of time to do it. I encourage you to please ask any questions you have as I go along, if I'm saying something that um, you don't understand or doesn't make sense, or just offer any comments you have. We'd love to hear it. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to respond to any of those questions or any of those comments right here and now um, until the end, and we'll see how much time we have. But uh, my associate Joe is going to write down every question that's asked, and we will post the answers to those questions on our website, and anybody who would like to see those, question, th those answers, just uh, take our card or give us your card at the end of the day, and we'll mail you a password to get into our website or just send us an email, and we'll send you a password. Please ask questions if something I'm saying doesn't make sense, if you disagree, or for whatever reason, please, any comments at all, Joe will ca ca capture them, and we will definitely respond to the gr greatest degree possible. Okay, uh, so let's get right into the tactical framework for success. Um, okay. Didn't exactly come up the way it was supposed to, but uh, we had to change PowerPoint formats going from my computer to lessons. So uh, this is our framework for success. It starts with leadership. It starts with each one of you in the room. If you're not the right people to do the job, forget it. You're not going to be successful. You're not going to be in business in five years. End of story. We're going to talk more about what I mean by the right person to do the job in a couple of minutes. Then we're going to get into a little bit of a discussion on what we call tactical strategy. I'm not sure if those two words actually go together that way if, uh, if you're uh, into the English language, but it's a concept that we've developed. From that, we're going to talk quickly about an operating plan 
to put that uh, tactical strategy into place, the financial and cash plans, finally performance. If you're not focusing on excellent performance, forget performance. If you're not focusing on excellent performance, you're not going to be successful. And then an assessment, constantly introspectively looking at what you're doing to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, in addition, the framework talk, uh, includes uh, understanding the factors that influence everything you do. And then finally, your information management system. If you're not getting good information management, you're not going to know what's going on. So um, let's, I'm going to skip leadership and do that one last because I want to talk about all the other topics first and then relate leadership to it. Let's talk about tactical strategy first. Tactical strategy starts, as does everything, with understanding what your customers want and making sure you give it to them. Most people know that. We add something to that that we have found a lot of people don't think about, which is the concept of sustainability. You've got to give customers what they want, but you've got to give it to them in a way that will sustain their interest and they'll come back again. In this example here, I suspect these people will never fly this airlines again. They may, have, they may be on, on the plane now, but they're not going to come back with the, the sustainability was not something that the airlines thought about. So in terms of our tactical strategy, the foundation for tactical strategy is, as I just said, customer focus. What is your customer purchasing? Use as an example McDonald's. If you ask people <coughs> what cu McDonald's customers are purchasing, most of them will tell you hamburgers and french fries. Well, that's true. They are purchasing that. But just as important, if not more important, they're purchasing taste, conven they're not even purchasing taste. They're purchasing convenience. They're purchasing location. They're purchasing price. What exactly is it that your customers are purchasing? I, we've listed a couple of generic topics. These are nothing but generic topics. You've got to customize them for yourself. What is it your customers are after? Once you've decided that, you've got to determine how are you going to meet your customers' needs? What are, the ta what are the things you're going to do? What are the tactics? What is the competitive advantage you're going to bring to the table? And what is your brand? Some of you may be familiar with, um, let's see. Oh, wrong button. Some of you may be familiar with um, Warren Buffett and how he refers to competitive advantage and brand. Anybody ever hear the name he, he, he associates with them? Anybody? He calls them your moat, M-O-A-T. What moat are you building around your organization to put a barrier up to keep the competition from coming in, from taking over? This is the basis, the foundation for everything that you need to think about as you, get, as you open your doors and as you start your business, or you need to think about if you are, in fact, a mature business. We're gonna what we talk about are the tactics here, not the strategy. But what are you doing to make sure that you are always meeting the customer's needs? What are you doing to make sure that your competitive advantage remains a competitive advantage? And what are you doing to make sure that your brand is something that the clients will, customers will know and will appreciate? I'm going to rephrase that, uh, that prior slide into a couple of bullets uh, under the heading of a, all this becomes a framework for your mission statement. Your mission statement starts with your customers' wants and needs, how you're going to meet them, your competitive advantage, and your brand. And I'm going to add one more thing to this, which is critical, and that is your standard product. I said earlier, um, the best advice I can give you is to uh, go out and work in a turnaround. You'll see what needs to be successful or not. Another very important piece of advice that we have found clients do not do is determine what their standard product is. You can't be all things to all people. You have to, s you have to draw a line around the key product that you're offering and the key processes that will, will generate that product. And that is the product that you're going to market with. I'm going to talk a little bit more about exception processing in a minute, but ultimately what we're saying here is you've got to be able to do the standard product well. You've got to be able to do the standard product excellent. Exception processes, more times than not, you need to recognize that they're an exception, and you need to walk away from them. 
at least until you've got the standard down pat. So in terms of, of the framework for your mission statement, how you meet, what is your standard product that is meeting the customer's needs? You must understand that. <coughs> okay, let me introduce to you the handout that, we, that Joe just gave out. We've called it a report card. What I would like e to ask each of you to do after you leave here today, we're not going to have time to go through it here today, but uh, I'd like to ask each one of you to go through the questions on the report card and ask yourself if, in fact, you're addressing or plan to address these, the, the, the topics of the question. The questions are organized in the pieces of paper we handed out into eight sections, one section for each of the topics on our framework, and you'll see there are questions related to, um, am I using the microphone properly, Les? Okay. Um, you'll, you'll see that there are questions related to each topic. You want to know, you want a quick tool to find out where you're at and if you're thinking about the right things, just take a quick look at these questions and answer, answer it, yes, we are thinking about it, or yes, we are doing it, or no, we're not, we haven't gotten ready for it yet. And then the last column on that piece of paper says, uh, what's your target date for, um, for doing this, if your answer is no, that you're not addressing this particular point right now. That becomes the input to your action plan. Determine the priorities, which ones you need to work on first, put in your target dates, and think about them. If you're trying to get cash because you're in an early phase startup, the more you know about the topics we're going to talk about, the more you sound like you're on top of what you're doing. You've already got cash. You may need cash a second go around. Well, again, are you on top of everything that needs to be done? Answer all these questions yes, and you'll be able to tell a much better story. Okay, so we just talked about tactical leadership in our framework for success. The next thing, topic I want to talk about is the operating plan for putting the tactics into place. What we call the foundation for our operating plan is what we call the end-to-end -end process. Something I alluded to earlier, you've got a standard product. You must understand each of the functions that are required in generating that standard product. Don't discount anything. Everything has to be understood. Our starting point in, in this discussion with clients is we talk about a generic end-to-end -end process. We break up the end-to-end -end process into six steps. This is our starting point. These are very generic. You can take something like this and throw it away and customize it for yourself. Not you could, you should. But at a minimum, these are six topics that, you are do that must be done in your organization for you to be successful. And you need to address each one of them. Once you've got your, your generic end-to-end -end process, you must think about the operating requirements for each one of those steps. A couple of generic topics that must be considered in your, in your uh, listing of requirements are the facilities you need. Plant and equipment, laboratories, office space, storefront. What do you need for each of those six steps in our generic end-to-end -end process or in your customized end-to-end -end process? What equipment, supplies, raw materials do you need? What methodologies and documentation are you going to develop? You can't expect people to generate a product if you haven't developed the way they're going to do it. If you, ha you can't expect that you're going to get your proper filing, government filings in, financial filings in, if you haven't developed the methodology to do it. You can't expect that you're going to have customers sign good contracts if you haven't developed that documentation yet. And then ultimately, the people. Everything starts and ends with the people. It start, excuse me, everything starts with you, the leaders, and then goes right through the people. Once you've established your generic end-to-end -end process, you know the things that have to be done. Once you identify all of your operating requirements, you know the requirements to get that done. What you now have to recognize, you've got to look in the mirror and recognize that you're not an expert in every one of those. You've got the bright idea, you can do some other things, but now you need to bring in some people who are experts in some of those other topics. Maybe they're employees, maybe you're outsourcing, maybe they're consultants. Whatever they are, you've got to make sure you've got the right people doing the things that need to be done, not you. You've got to focus on what you do best. Once you know your end-to-end -end process, you know your operating requirements, what you then need to do 
is understand your pipeline. Our definition of pipeline is a map across the end-to-end -end process that transactions go through, but add to that map standards and goals and expectations so you can project what's going to happen when. You could project what your operating requirements are when it happens. You could project what cash you need, and you could project uh, what cash you're going to be receiving. I'm going to take a couple of minutes to go through a, an example of a generic pipeline uh, just to give you a little bit more um, understanding of what I'm talking about. Let's first talk about marketing and sales, and I broke marketing and sales up into three subtopics, new prospects, proposals, and close. So in our generic pipeline, uh, the first step in our map is identifying a process. Our goal is to identify 100 new prospects each week. Down the bottom of the screen, I've uh, cr created a little bit of a calendar just to track when things are happening. So, um, so we start with 100 prospects each week. The next step in our map is, is a proposal to those contracts. And again, this is all generic. You may not even put out proposals. I'm trying to present a point here. Uh, our standard is to, our goal is to uh, issue proposals to 32% of the new prospects and get those proposals out within 15 days. That's our standard for when they're going to be uh, generated. So by February 22nd, in our calendar on the bottom of the page, we will have issued 32 proposals. And further, our goal is to close on 25% of those proposals. So, and that within five days. Obviously, all made up numbers to make a point. The point here, just looking at marketing and sales, is that if we want to have, uh, in our plans, we want to have five deals closed by, Mar excuse me, eight deals closed by March 1st. To do that, on February 1st, we've got to identify 100 new prospects. From a planning standpoint, right away, this tells us what do we need to do to close? Do we need lawyers? Do we accountants? What and who do we need? And we better have those in place on the week of March 1st because we're going to have eight deals that have to be closed. Continuing in the pipeline, let's continue now in our map, production, implementation, or delivery, and customer support. So we now say uh, for production, 100% of the deals that we close, we're going to produce the product within 20 days. So we now know by March 29th, we're going to have to produce eight products. We better have all of those operating requirements that we talked about, we better have them in place by March 29th because that's when we're going to have to start doing our production. We're going to implement each of those in five days, April 8th, and uh, the day after they're implemented, we're going to start providing customer support. Just continuing in our map, administration, invoicing. We want to we invoice our clients five days after the product is implemented, and our goal is to have that cash in-house in 100 days. Now, what this, what this document does, this is just a summary of the document. What this document, this is a very powerful document. I can't stress enough the importance of thinking along these lines. Because what this does is, from a planning standpoint, it tells you when you need to have things ready. From an operational standpoint, if the week of uh, February 1st, you only talk to 75 prospects, well, what does that mean down the line in terms of suddenly we might get less volume? Or we still want the same volume of, uh, of, of eight of invoice. We still, our, our goal actually on May 17th is to still receive the same amount of money, but we've only spoken to uh, uh, 75 rather than 100 prospects. We better do something during this process to still meet our numbers. Instead of, instead of the 32% here, we better close a lot higher percentage than 32%. And what do you have to do to do that? We've got to now start planning for that. So this also tells us in terms of, of its power, um, if, we're, if we're doing this plan in January, we're not getting any money in until May. So we better have enough cash in place between now and May to, to meet all of our operating requirements. This is a concept most people don't do, and suddenly they find themselves short of cash. They find themselves having to meet a customer's expectation, and they don't meet it. 
Ultimately, you don't think like this, you're going to end up failing. Now, what I just presented was a very black and white, very nice uh, concept. 100% of this, 100% of that, 100% of this, 100% of that. The problem with life is it's not that simple. So in addition to laying out all of your, your, your flows, all of your end-to-end -end processes, and all of your requirements for the standard product, you also have to take in mind exception processing and your exception product. Because those things do happen. And what, what are they going to mean to you in terms of your requirements? Are you going to be ready to do certain exception processes? What exception processes do you absolutely not want to have? And uh, you've got to build that into your pipeline as well. I ca I've said it once. I'm going to say it again right now, and I'm going to repeat myself. I cannot stress the importance of this enough no matter where you are in your process. You've got to be ready for the first client. You've got to be ready for subsequent clients after that, and you want to sustain that first client. You've got to always think and plan ahead. You're looking to find cash. You've got to show people that you've thought ahead. You've addressed all your issues. You're on top of all of this. So I cannot stress that enough. We ha you have in your handout um, your report card questions for the um, operating plan. I urge you to uh, ask yourself those questions, determine where you are, and change your thinking accordingly. The next step in the framework is uh, financial plans um, and cash plans. Let's talk about cash first. Everybody, I think, is familiar with your cash, and ca uh, your, your, your cash flow statements. Basically, uh, they summarize two things, cash uses and cash sources. Now, based on what I've said, you can very accurately predict from your pipeline, you can predict the timing of when your cash is going to be needed and when your cash is going to be received. You don't have to guess at it. You're always on top of it. And most importantly, you're always adjusting it as things change in life. These concepts are as applicable to a 100-year-old, very successful company as they are to a startup. These are things that you must always be doing if you want to be successful, if you want to stay in business. Everybody has cash problems. So uh, in your cash flow statement, um, just focusing on operations, uh, using the pipeline example that we uh, referred to earlier, uh, February, March, and April, we've just got cash going out. We don't have cash coming in until May. Do we have enough cash on hand to finance all those operations in, in February, March, and April? Something you've always got to be ready for. Don't think because you've got a great product that therefore these, these, uh, these topics, uh, these issues, aren't going to be issues. There are always issues. In terms of financial planning, your, uh, just talk about P&L for a second. Your P&L budget can be, should be based and tied in very much to your pipeline. You can't predict that you're going to have revenue expense or what your net is going to be in any quarter of the year until you've developed your pipeline and you know what you've built your operations for. Don't say that you're going to have revenue of uh, $1,500 in the third quarter if you don't have enough people to go out and identify the prospects that will ultimately flow through the pipeline to get you that revenue in the third quarter. So you can tie your pipeline into your financial planning very easily, and you can support it, and you can understand the difference when something in the pipeline doesn't work the way you're supposed to. Now, what happens when your actuals don't equal your forecast? Happens every now and then, right? Um, this is another area where we have found, I'll say, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be generous and say only 95% of the people that we deal with don't manage this properly. I'm sure it's, more than, sure it's more than that, but I'll be generous and say 95%. And here's the question. Your first quarter, obviously, you didn't hit your goal. So the question is, what should your full year number be? Should it still be 1850, or should it be something different than that? You've got to address that. You've got to think about it. If you still want it to be 1850, that means somewhere in the second quarter, third quarter, or fourth quarter, you've got to ramp up what you're doing. Now go back to your pipeline. Can you ramp up what you're doing? Do you have the cash to, to, uh, to, to get the operating requirements? Do you have the people in place? Do you have the time, depending on how long it takes to get through that pipeline? If you can't do it, why bother keeping it at 1850? Let's not create uh, 
numbers that we, that we can't hit and then get frustrated by it. And more importantly, then we show our financiers that we're not hitting our numbers. If you must hit that 1850, then you better make sure you've already, this was already based on your pipeline, you better make sure you make some adjustments in that pipeline to increase revenue in the second and third and fourth quarter so that you can hit the 1850. I can't, sounds like mom and apple pie. I can't tell you how many people don't do that. They just say, we got to do it, and we're going to work harder. End of story. Unfortunately, that is the end of the story, because that's all that happens at that point. Nothing more than that. You've got to plan for it. You've got to always keep that pipeline in mind. So we've got our questions for, our report card questions for financial and cash planning. I encourage you to ask yourself those questions to see where you're at in your planning. The next stop in our framework is what we call excellent performance. We don't settle for anything less than excellent. And because this is so important, I'm going to talk very little about it. Because I want to make a point, there's not a lot to say. Excellent is excellent. Uh, we're going to start with our framework for our mission statement. And we're going to add to it another bubble. Everything we do, everything we do, has to be efficient, meaning making the best use of our time and our resources. Cash is critical when you're in a startup. Time is currency as well. It's critical. Time and money, uh, all resources. We've got to be effective. Everything you're doing has to be done because you're trying to achieve a goal. You're trying to meet customers' needs. If you can't establish the link between what you're doing and goals and customers' needs, then you have to question why you're doing it. Everything has to add value. There has to be uh, ultimately like a snowball rolling downhill getting bigger. There always has to be value being added. If you're not adding value, why are you doing it? And you've got to be responsive to your customers, responsive to your stakeholders at all times. Now, all of that is mom and apple pie. People think about performance. They think about these things. But what we have found is people typically associate excellent performance with people. Our people have to be excellent performers. And the point here is that you've got to think very differently than that. You've got to think much beyond that. Absolutely, people will generate the results, and they have to be excellent. But you've got to measure those results and that excellence, and you've got to create the standards and then measure against the standards, not only in terms of people, but first of all, in terms of your end-to-end -end process. Is product development excellent? Forget people, what makes an excellent product development organization? What makes an ex excellent production customer support organization? Not just are we doing it, but what makes it excellent and are we being excellent? Is our customer support efficient and effective, value-added and responsive? Think beyond people. In addition, think of all your operating requirements. Your facilities can make a big difference in whether or not you're efficient and effective, having the right facilities. All your equipment, your methodologies also fit into that. You've got to ask yourself that question at all times, those questions at all times. It's not just your people that have to be excellent. It's your end-to-end your -end processes. It's everything that you are bringing to the table to get the job done. Everything has to be excellent. Ultimately, you've got to have goals and standards for efficiency, effectiveness, value-added, and responsive. You've got to make sure you're meeting them. And these are just generic, by the way, efficient, effective, value-added, and responsive. Make sure you include those in your list, but customize your list for what you do and what you need. Nothing I'm saying here is the be-all and end-all. Everything has to be customized. You've got your report card for performance. The next step in the pyramid is assessment. I'm going to just confuse things a little, little bit more and skip that and come back to it. I want to make some other points first. Factors influencing expectations and results. You can make the greatest plans in the world. You all know those plans are only good for a couple of days. Something changes that causes a change in that expectation. So the question is, are you, uh, do you still have the Batmobile bat available to get the job done? Or are you suddenly driving some type of hybrid that ain't going to get you there? You've got to be ready for these changes, and you've got to be ready to react to them. So uh, in terms of what are the factors that influence change, I've just created a generic list. Uh, you need to um, come up with your own list. 
I would recommend you include each one of these in your list, but you've got to come up with your own list of what are the factors that can influence how you get the job done. Just, um, I, I heard something on the news yesterday which I thought was interesting um, in terms of environment and in terms of weather. The farmers in the southeast United States are having a lot of problems. They're having problems because there haven't been a lot of hurricanes this year. The hurricanes don't do as much damage to the farms as the value they get from the water from the hurricanes. Not a lot of hurricanes, not a lot of water, they're hurting. So you need to understand what the, um, what the topics are that can influence what you do. You need to be able to plan for them. And you need to make sure you understand that um, those, um, those factors that can influence you can influence anything in your organization and everything has an impact on each other. <coughs> You've got a report card. In terms of information management, um, I got my master's in information science. I consider this to be so critical that I can't tell you. Simple example I can use is when you get up in the morning, you get into your car, you know where you need to go, you look at your gas gauge to see if you've got enough gas to get there. You've, you're get, you've, you've established your dashboard, literally the dashboard, and you've established your metric to tell you if you've got enough gas to get where you're going. If you ignore it, you might run out of gas. And guess what happens then? You don't achieve your goal for the day. You don't get where you need to go. That's the simplest analogy I can draw. Information management is critical. You must identify information that, gives that measures, that gives you feedback on your expectations, your results, your status, and your trends. And you must understand, you must also get set feedback on your plans, your influences, and your performance. So you've got your report card. An assessment, um, Les has given me the high sign, so I've got to speed up here. Uh, when we talk about assessment, um, you think you know where you're at, but are you really there? Just an example of questions that we have found people don't ask themselves, which give them an indication that they're not where they think they are. I'm going to break out the world into what we call the pillars of, of uh, tactics, these four topics, and um, what we have found is uh, somebody thinks that they have uh, an excellent process, but the customers are not thrilled. They have backlogs. Well, guess what? You don't, they don't have an excellent process. They need to do some type of assessment to understand why. Information management, uh, material surprises are occurring. Well, if material surprises are occurring, you're not getting good information. Uh, if you've got breakdowns, thing, if things are breaking down, then you don't have good controls. And if you find you're having problems with cash or your financials, there's something wrong in your financial activities, you need, you're not assessing yourself properly. So you need to ask yourself some very simple questions. Are things happening the way they're supposed to? And if not, you need to take a closer look at why you need to do an assessment of, of your activities. Finally, leadership. I said I wanted to do this last because I wanted to talk about all of these other topics and ultimately what leadership is all about. Uh, this was earlier my generic model for mission statement. This is now my generic model for, for a leadership model. As, ma as, as leaders, You've got to be committed to each one of these things. You've got to understand what it takes to do it. And most importantly, you've got to demonstrate that commitment every single day to your employees, to your associates, to your stakeholders. Every day in your written word, in your, wor in your oral word, in your activities, your deeds, you've got to show that you are committed to doing things right. You want to be in business in five years. You want to be successful. And you know the only way to do it is to think and plan ahead. So you've got your leadership report card. In summary, we have our tactical framework for success. You must address each one of these topics if you want to be successful. Our goals for today was to introduce that tactical framework, which we did, uh, suggest a tool, which we gave you out, simple report card, and highlight priorities for an action plan. For anything in the report card where you've answered no, fill in that last column, determine your part, what's most important, and, um, and establish a target date to start thinking about it. And uh, ultimately, um, that's us. If anybody has any questions, we'd be more than happy to address those. Thank you.